Welcome back. Well, one in two aspiring teachers, as I said last night, are failing to finish their degree within six years, given the degree is only a three-year degree. That's double the time. And five times the number of students are now accepted into education courses with ATARs lower than 50. Now, we discussed all of this, and after the show last night, I was flooded with queries from viewers about how the ATAR is even calculated. So let me bring in my panel and broadcaster wordsmith extraordinaire, Mr Kel Richard, who will help explain all of this, alongside my other guest down here in Melbourne, Gideon Rosner, Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs. Now, Kel, we we'll talk about ATAR scores quite a bit. They're complicated. I'm from the old Anderson score days, uh, which was your top four subjects and 10% of your fifth down here in Victoria in the bad old days, or the good old days, I have to say. How's the ATAR worked out? OK. If we can preempt the best of bolt and you can give me about an hour, I'll explain it all to you. <laughs> but, but short of that, OK, this is the short answer. Uh, the ATAR is not a mark. It doesn't come out of the work you've done. It's not a mark. It's a ranking. So if your ATAR number is 70, it means you are better than 70% of the other students that year and worse than 30%. That's what it's telling you. It's calculated from about four different elements, including exam marks and assessments and things like that, they go into it. But the actual mark you get, again, is based on a kind of ranking system. Let, can I use an example that the university submission used trying to explain how it works? The, the, their, their imaginary example is this. John is in a class of 10 people. There are no class of 10 people, but anyway, John's in a class of 10, and he scores regularly in the middle. He's number five. If the class, when they do a big final exam, get an average score of 80, because he's fifth and in the middle, he will be given a score of 80 because that's the class average, right? So it's, it's done on that kind of rank. Now, that means if you're in a class with a lot of dumb people, you could be dragged down or you could actually be pushed up because you'd be higher in the rankings. If you're in a class full of really smart people, you'd be pushed down because there'd be more people above you. So that becomes a component. It's like the old bell curve for people that remember the old HSC or the VCE. But Gideon, the problem here is, oh, well, it's not the problem. I think it's the reality and it's, it's the reason for the debate that, that over the past 10 years, mm. by a factor of five times, we've got more people going into teaching that are sub-50 on their ATAR. So they're basically failing mm. against their peer group of any given year, mm. yet they are going to be the teachers of the future. And we wonder why we're going backwards. Well, we're going backwards for a range of reasons, but as Kel said, it is a ranking system and universities use it not to reflect the difficulty of the course, but as a ma me measure of supply and demand. That's why you need... How popular the course Correct. Is. So you need an intro of, you know, 90 something to be a lawyer, even though, you know, being a lawyer arguably isn't that much more important than being a teacher. It's sad that we have, we don't have our best and brightest going into teaching, but we have to make it a profession that people want to go into a prestigious profession because it is very important. We have to allow for performance pay for teachers, for example. We have to allow for genuine career progression, not career progression based on how long you've been serving. We have to allow principals to hire and fire the best and brightest teachers for their school. But all of that is opposed by the teachers' unions. Yeah, it is. It is. I want to go into another issue. Roads, ray, no, roads rates and rubbish. Local councils, we've got to have that, don't we? Get back to basics, Kel. The IPA has got a big report out saying that's what people want. Yeah, and there are stupid things happening. There are local councils that have got a climate policy. I'm sorry. Australia produces 1.3 of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. What do you think Belmore does? I mean, it's, it's, it's an idiotic thing for them to have a, a, a climate policy. They'll have a BDS policy, the Boycott, Divest, Sanctions policy against Israel. We don't want them to do that. That's not their job. What they are doing and doing badly is a lot of uh, local council areas are getting massive overdevelopment without local consultation. So suddenly, you know, the road Roads are flooded. Uh, you have to wait for ages at every traffic light. And the, there's no parking at the local shops because the council has decided we're going to have all these huge, tall, high-rise buildings in the place. And they've given up on one of the other basics, which is building standards. Why are there tall buildings with, with cracks in them and poor building standards? Local councils are the people we trust to look after building standards. They're not doing their job. They should stick to their knitting. OK, I've got to go in a minute, but last word to you. This is your report. This is our report, but I'll just give you one example to beat Kells. The city of Port Phillip last year put out a nuclear non-proliferation <laughs> policy. Now, there is no local, government on Earth, no local government on Earth, to my knowledge, with a nuclear weapons arsenal yet. This is what they're concentrating on. You're absolutely right, Kell. Rubbish rates and roads and two-thirds yes, of Australians yeah. agree with us. Absolutely. <laughs> We've got a bar on nuclear power, nuclear energy, nuclear everything in this country. <laughs> and here we, have a, here we have a local council not far down the road from here. Got to leave it there, gentlemen. I need a drink after all of that. Talk to you next time. time. Thank you, everyone Thanks, who, at home for your company.